Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Jordan Brown? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. I'll start with the timeline of the crime, and then I'll move to my analysis. The shooting in this case takes place in 2009 in the borough of Wampum, Pennsylvania. This borough has about 700 residents. It is located in Lawrence County, just over 40 miles northwest of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We see a number of people who were involved in this case. 26-year-old Kenzie Houck was a hairstylist and a stay-at-home mom. She and her fiancé, Chris Brown, who worked in a shipping department at a local company, were going to have a baby together. Kenzie Houck was eight and a half months pregnant. She and Chris Brown had moved in together with Houck's two daughters from a prior relationship, Janessa, age seven, and Adeline, age four, and Brown's son from a prior relationship, 11-year-old Jordan Brown. Because of the number of people in the story who share a last name, I'm going to use first names to refer to them. This brings us to the morning of February 20, 2009. Chris went to work that morning. Kenzie was still in bed. According to Jordan, at 8.15 a.m., he and Janessa left the house in order to get on the school bus. At 9 a.m., workers who were trimming trees noticed that Adeline was in the doorway of the house crying and saying her mother was dead. When the police arrived, they found Kenzie in her bed, shot in the back of the head. Chris Brown was quickly eliminated as a suspect. The police interviewed him and checked for gunpowder residue. They couldn't find anything. They were confident he was not involved. Jordan and Janessa would tell the police that nothing out of the ordinary happened that morning. But Jordan said he did remember seeing a black truck near the garage. The police interviewed Janessa several times. They only recorded one of those interviews. After Janessa said that she didn't remember anything, the police told her that her grandparents believed Jordan killed Kenzie. After hearing this, Janessa remembered something new. She said that Jordan was moving his guns around that morning. When she was waiting downstairs for Jordan to walk with her to the bus, she heard a big boom that she recognized as coming from a firearm. Jordan denied having touched his firearms that morning and denied committing homicide. At the scene, the police noticed a 12-gauge shotgun that had the strong odor of gunshot residue, like it had been fired recently. It was a Harrington and Richardson youth model 20-gauge shotgun. Jordan had received it as a Christmas present from his father. About 18 hours after the shooting, the police would show up at the house and arrest Jordan Brown for the murder of Kenzie Houck. The next day, the police would find a spent 20-gauge shotgun shell next to the driveway. People in the community were in disbelief. Nobody believed an 11-year-old could commit this type of crime. Kenzie's former boyfriend, a man named Adam Harvey, was investigated by the police. He had allegedly made threatening messages to Kenzie on a prior occasion. The police said there's no way he could have committed the crime. There was snow on the hood of his vehicle that was intact, suggesting he could not have made the drive to Kenzie's house and back to his neighborhood. In addition, there was no gunshot residue on his hands, and he had an alibi witness that placed him at home during the time the shooting was taking place. Initially, Jordan was going to be tried as an adult, but a little over two years later, the case was moved to juvenile court. Instead of facing life in prison without the possibility of parole, he was facing being incarcerated until the age of 21. The trial only lasted for three days. Jordan Brown was adjudicated delinquent, for first-degree murder and criminal homicide of an unborn child. Adjudicated delinquent is the juvenile court equivalent of being found guilty. Jordan's attorneys appealed the conviction, and three and a half years later, the case was heard by the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. The attorneys made a fairly good argument. They said there was no blood or tissue found on the 20-gauge shotgun or on Jordan's clothing. They noted that the gunpowder residue on Jordan's shirt and pants could have come from a recent turkey shoot. They said it was not unusual to find spent shells near the house. The use of firearms was common on the property. 
they claim that the police officers had no special training in smelling firearms to determine if they had been recently fired. As the appeal was going on, Jordan Brown was released. He was 18 years old. This was in 2016. In July 2018, his conviction was overturned. The Pennsylvania Supreme Court said there was insufficient evidence to prosecute the case. Double jeopardy was attached, so he can never be tried for that crime again. Jordan Brown says that he has post-traumatic stress disorder. He is studying computer science and trying to move on with his life. In 2020, Jordan Brown sued the former Pennsylvania State Police Commissioner and four former state troopers who were involved in his case. He accused them of creating a false narrative and violating his constitutional rights. So moving to my analysis. This is a challenging case. The police have made it fairly clear that they are confident Jordan Brown killed Kenzie Houck. Jordan, of course, maintains his innocence. People tend to end up in three different camps as far as opinions in this case. Jordan did it, and this should be clear to everyone. The evidence is clear. He did it, but there's not enough evidence to prove that he was guilty, and Jordan Brown didn't do it. He is completely innocent. Let's look at the evidence both for and against the idea that Brown was guilty of murder. Evidence pointing toward guilt. It is clear that Kenzie Houck was murdered with a firearm, and the fatal shot was not self-inflicted. I'm not aware of anyone involved in this case who disagrees on that particular point. There is no evidence that anyone else capable of committing murder was in the house. Jordan Brown was the only other person in the house who had fired a weapon on a prior occasion. There was no forced entry. Nobody saw anything. No other DNA. No fingerprints. No footprints. No signs of a struggle. Nothing was stolen. Absolutely nothing indicates someone else was in that house. The one reasonably good alternative suspect, the ex-boyfriend, could not have done it. There was a light covering of snow in the area. There were no footprints or tire tracks indicating somebody had approached the house during the time when the shooting could have occurred. Jordan was familiar with firearms and owned a firearm. A police officer noted the strong odor of gunshot residue coming from the 20-gauge shotgun owned by Jordan Brown. Now, even though the defense said the police didn't have training in detecting gunshot residue odor, when a gun is recently fired, it is pretty clear. Somebody can smell that without significant training in that area. The shotgun shell that was found along the driveway was right along the footprints left in the snow by Jordan Brown. There was a big change coming for the family. In about two weeks or so, Kenzie would have given birth to a son. Janessa's statements inculpated Jordan Brown. If one were to believe her statements, it would be difficult to believe Jordan Brown was innocent. Gunshot residue was found on Jordan Brown's clothes. In the detention center, staff reported that Jordan Brown did not show a lot of emotion, and when he was caught doing something wrong, he would desperately try to escape responsibility, sometimes even blaming others for his actions. He was not straightforward, and he was quick to anger. So now let's look at the evidence pointing toward innocence. No biological material was on Jordan Brown or the weapon that the police said was used in the crime. One court during the appeals process said it was reasonable to believe the 20-gauge shotgun was not even the murder weapon. 11-year-old murderers are extremely rare, although not completely unheard of. There was not much about Jordan Brown's personality that would indicate he could be guilty of this type of crime. In the rare instances where there is an extremely young homicidal offender, people often report that they were odd, a loner, antisocial, or a troublemaker. Jordan Brown never had any interactions with the criminal justice system prior to his arrest. A mental health assessment revealed that Jordan Brown had average intelligence, strong social support, demonstrated strong attachment to responsible adults, had a positive attitude toward authority figures, was involved in positive social activities, and had no significant history of counseling or therapy. It was concluded he had no mental disorders. In addition, usually young offenders crack when they are interviewed by the police. Jordan Brown maintained his innocence the entire time. It seems difficult to believe that an 11-year-old boy could have retrieved the weapon, loaded it, shot his soon-to-be stepmother in the back of the head when she was in bed, 
and return the shotgun after wiping it down. What's more, after this, he simply goes to school like nothing happened. He wasn't shaking. He didn't have any other visible signs of distress. Next point, why did the police officers fail to record the interviews? Maybe they had the little-known fear of being held responsible disorder. The key witness against Jordan Brown was only seven years old. She only changed her story after being interviewed multiple times and after a suggestion was given to her. There is a reason seven-year-olds find it difficult to obtain employment as expert witnesses. With all that in mind, do I think that Jordan Brown was actually guilty? Do I think he really did it? Yes. As hard as it is to believe that an 11-year-old could do this, it's harder for me to believe that some sort of floating assailant who could travel through walls entered the house and shot Kenzie Houck, then left undetected. Like the police should have called Ghostbusters or something. It just doesn't make sense how this could have happened if Jordan Brown wasn't the killer. Usually when we see women murdered in circumstances like this, the assailant was trying to do something in addition to causing death, like he would commit a sexual assault or theft. This homicide was more like an execution. The only point of the crime was ending her life. So those are my thoughts on actual guilt or innocence. What about the idea of reasonable doubt? Do I think Jordan Brown was guilty beyond a reasonable doubt? No. I think the police made so many mistakes in the investigation, they created reasonable doubt for him. Running under the assumption that Kenzie Houck was essentially a stepmother, like she was in the role even though she was not married to Chris Brown, what does the research literature tell us about males who murder their stepmothers? This type of crime is so rare, we hardly see anything in the research literature that we can use to compare to it. Offenders who would do this are almost always over 18 years of age and often have mental illnesses involving psychosis, but that's really all we know. This case really doesn't make sense in light of the research literature, although again, there's so little research literature that there's really no way to draw any meaningful comparisons. So what could have happened in a case like this? Running under the assumption that Jordan Brown actually did commit the crime, What strikes me about this case is how an 11-year-old had access to lethal weapons. This would have allowed somebody in his position to convert a little bit of impulsivity into homicide. Perhaps he was upset about the upcoming birth of his brother, but this normally would not have caused really too much in the way of bad behavior, except he had access to a gun. I guess the analogy would be holding a match over a bucket of water as compared to holding a match over a bucket of gasoline. The match is the same either way, but the surroundings make it dangerous. I believe the responsible use of firearms makes a lot of sense. The key word here is responsible. I can't think of a good reason an 11-year-old should have unrestricted access to firearms. Those are my thoughts on the Jordan Brown case. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis on this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.